Good morning again. Scripture reading today of God's Word is in Luke 24. <clears throat> On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the <coughs> stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in cloth, clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their face to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. So bad. So I'll just go ahead and warn you. I've got a long sermon. No, I don't. <laughs> I saw you look. <laughs> Father in heaven, we thank you today that we can come and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, that you would love us so much that Jesus would die, but our hopes aren't just founded in the fact that we're forgiven of our sins. Our hopes are founded that Jesus rose from the dead, that he has ascended into heaven, that he is preparing a place for us, and he will come to take us home. Open up our minds and our hearts today to hear your words so that we can apply them and live the life that you have called us to live until he returns and we forever be with him. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So if you came out this morning, which my grandkids did, that's why they're sacked out now, for a sunrise service, we had a beautiful sunrise come over the mountain. That's unusual in northern Idaho this time of year, right? Because <laughs> it's usually rainy and everything. But we got to see a beautiful sunrise this morning. And everybody knows why we're here today, right? Oh, it's not for candy? I thought it was for, yeah, crackles and stuff. This has been in my pocket, though. It's kind of mushy. It's not about candy and eggs? No? Oh, I, I thought it was. <laughs> Yummy. I had, a, I had a Cadbury egg the other day. I mean, I used to think they were gross. But the one I had the other day was delicious. I was like, what am I missing out on? And whenever we take Kira to the grocery store, if you've noticed, they conveniently put them right at the checkout aisle. So by the time you see and you're checking out, she's got one halfway through eating it when it's all over and everything. But she will tell you that today is about Jesus. See, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. No one else can make that claim. No religion can make that claim. There are not many ways to God. You can't get to God yourself. You are a sinner. All sin, all fall short of God's glorious standard. But because God loves you, because He's rich in mercy and grace, He provided a way, and His name is Jesus. When Jesus rode into to Jerusalem, he rode in and the crowds recognized him as the, the king. But see, the problem was is they wanted a king that met their expectations. I want a king that takes care of me and everything. But the king of all kings, Lord of all lords, came to die for me. And he calls us to live a life of that also. Do not forget that, O oh Christian. Yesterday we went, a group of us from... Uh, Awanas went to see Pilgrim's Progress. And I hope that opened their eyes some on that trek that we face. That we face temptations and trials and misery and desperation and everything else. But we have an interpreter that lives inside of us. The Holy Spirit, God Himself, lives inside of us. That's why Peter can call us a group of holy priests. Called to proclaim the word to others so that they might know God. That they might know Him personally that they can cry out to him as their father in heaven. But Easter gets to be commercialized so much. If you look on the bulletin, you'll see what I mentioned this morning. There's the Easter bunny and an Easter egg, and they're looking at the cross, and they say, what is this? Because we don't even know what this holiday is anymore. So please, please, please teach your children. Tell your friends and neighbors about the love of Jesus Christ. And the thing that is different, like I said, is there is an empty tomb. 
Jesus has risen from the dead. It's not blind faith that we believe this by. It's, we believe it by the Word of God, but we believe it as a fact from history. If you go and research, you'll find that there is more proof about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not that Jesus Christ lived or died or anything else, but that He rose from the dead. There is more evidence about that than the fact that Caesar even existed. That's not just from the Bible, that's from history itself. Some people think that, that he swooned, that he passed out on the cross and really wasn't dead. But Roman soldiers were good at that. When they pierced, pierced his side, as you heard Michaela say earlier, there came water and blood, which shows signs of asphyxiation, that he died on the cross by, suffer, by suffering and um, losing his oxygen and, and dying that way of asphyxiation. See, when he was on that cross, he had to raise himself up each time to take a breath and then come back down. On a battered and bruised and open wound back that rubbed up and down that cross each and every time that he breathed for us so that he could die for us. The women went and found the tomb that night. They weren't mistaken about where the tomb was. It wasn't that they went back to the wrong tomb Sunday morning. Anybody could have went back to the tomb and said, here it is, here's his body. But no one proved that. Oh, if he passed out, yeah, he would be half comatose and everything, and they would be following around a guy that could barely, well, he'd have to be carried around. Come on. There's no way that he, he could walk around and lead people around. And you have people that you saw from the resurrection eggs again that Peter denied him three times. Peter, the one, I'll go anywhere with you, Lord. And he denied him three times because he thought to himself, wait a minute, this following Jesus might cost me my life, and I don't know if I'm ready to do that or not. But then after the resurrection, after you see someone who is dead, risen from the dead again, and don't forget, we already had Lazarus. We had the miracle of that. But how can Jesus raise himself from the dead when he, in fact, is dead? Unless his claims are true that he is the Son of God, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. There is an empty tomb that no other religion can claim. And that's why we're here today. To, rep, to honor a resurrected Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us if we believe in our heart and profess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, not Savior, Lord, that you believe that. Jesus also says that if anyone wants to be his disciple, he will deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after him. He has called you not only to believe, but he's called you to be a light to the world that your good deeds will shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and glorify their Father which is in heaven. We have that privilege and honor to be like Christ. And we don't have to do it on our own. Again, from the Pilgrim's Progress movie, the, the pilgrim named Christian kept referring back to what the interpreter told him because the interpreter, the Holy Spirit, was teaching him the Word of God teaching him what Jesus was like so that he could live a life that would glorify God. In the pews, I've put some common English Bibles in there. You'll see them now. So we've got a children's Bible, and then we've got a little common English Bible that has um, more of a teenage-looking thing on it. So we've got a Bible that appears to each age group. And I'm going to read from the common English Bible for just a minute. In John chapter 11, remember that's the chapter before Jesus came in triumphantly into Jerusalem in, in John chapter 12. We have a man that is dead. His name is Lazarus. He's in the tomb for four days. This is past all the time frame that you mess with the body and everything else. He is dead. And depending on which version that you read, it says, Surely, Lord, you don't want to go near him. He stinketh. He's dead. Dead as can be. And Jesus calls him to come out of the grave. And Jesus calls all men to come out of the grave, to be a new creation in Christ, to live by the power of God, not to the sinful desires that you had when you lived in ignorance, but to live according to the Spirit, this new life that is given you. John chapter 3, when Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees that came, that comes back later to the tomb, he's... Jesus tells him, he says, unless you are born again. He says, how can I be born again? How can I come out of my mother's womb again? And he says, you're the teacher. You should know these things. Unless you die to your sinful nature 
and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you will never live. Okay? And in John chapter 11, um, if we read verse 4, it says, When he heard this, Jesus said, This illness isn't fatal. It is for the glory of God so, that God so that God's Son can be glorified through it. How can it not be fatal if he's dead? Well, if you read on, it goes on to say he is dead. But what Jesus is saying is he has the power over death. He can give you life. And if we can read on down and get to, let's get to verse 15. It says, for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you can believe. That's the reason that John writes his gospel. He writes it almost a hundred times so that you may believe that Jesus Christ is who he claims to be. We're reading through scripture now. Are you keeping up with your reading? You knew I was going to remind you today. So you're reading all this Old Testament that points up to Jesus Christ. You can see that in what you're reading. Everything that is written in the Old Testament points to the fact that we're sinful people and we need a Savior, and His name is Jesus. So this was done so that you would realize that Jesus is the one that Scriptures talk about. So He said, For your sakes I'm glad that I wasn't there so that you can believe. Let's go to Him. Then Thomas, the one called Didymus. What does Didymus mean? Does it mean doubting? That's what comes to your head, isn't it? No, it means twin. Nobody ever asks who his twin is, but they always call him Doubting Thomas because he says, I, I want to see your hands and your feet. But, hey, come on, let's don't give him a bad rap. Would you not want to have proof if some dead guy came back? Say, prove to me that you're who you say you are. And obviously they all had proof because they all went to different parts of the world and died for the faith that they believed. Why would, why would 12 men die for a lie? I'm counting Paul in there as the 12th one, so you know. So Thomas, the one called Didymus in verse 16, said to the other disciples, let us go to so that we may die with Jesus. And depending on your translation, and remember we don't have punctuation marks and stuff, was Thomas doubting? Was he saying it sarcastically? Should we go that we die with Jesus? Or was he saying, let's go, let's die with Jesus? If that's what it takes, if my life means living, I've got to live my life so that I die, I'm willing to do that for the resurrection and the life. See, we don't know how he said it, but I like to think it that way rather than he was doubting at this point. So I just want to point that out to you. And then if you drop down to verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now, though, I know that whatever you ask, God will give you, because she knew that he was who he claimed to be. Okay? Jesus told her, Your brother will rise again. Martha replied, I know that he'll rise again at the resurrection on the last day. But see, they didn't have the concept that Jesus could raise them physically from the dead also. He's the one that created all things. He can break the order of them. Thank goodness we have gravity and other laws, but we're talking to the one who created the laws in the first place. Okay? Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She replied, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, God's Son, the one who is coming in the world. Now that's huge. Because she believes everything that is prophesied in the Old Testament. She believes everything that the Jewish nation has lived for and made their sacrifices for and everything else that we've read about. Jesus Christ is the one. But think about it. Then he rides into Jerusalem. They accept him. And days later he's being whipped, beaten by the Roman Empire that they thought he was going to overturn and bring them freedom because that's the kind of God I want is to take away the persecutions from the life that I live now. But he didn't. Instead, he went silent before his accusers. He was whipped, beaten, mocked, spit upon. His clothes were divided and cast by lots. He was ridiculed and shamed. Why? So that he could be an offering for your sins to take your place so that God's wrath wouldn't be taken out on you. 
That's what happened Friday on the cross. What a great thing. We, we get our sins forgiven because the Lamb of God has come to take away the sins of the world. But what about the resurrection? Without the resurrection, would you have any hope? Or would you think that maybe, just maybe, that Jesus wasn't who he said he was? If there's anyone here that says they wouldn't doubt, I'm going to call you whatever your name is, the liar. Oh yeah, Jacob means liar or deceiver, so I can do it for Jacob. <laughs> means liar or deceiver. You know you would doubt. All your hopes and dream were in this man that you don't understood. You thought the kingdom of God was coming now. Even the disciples when Jesus ascended said, is this the time you're going to restore the nation of Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons, but I will give you power and you will be my witnesses. You are the light of the world. You're a city built on a hill that the world can see the light and the light will expose the darkness and the darkness will not overcome it. But if people don't come to the light, it's because they love their sinful deeds more. They want to stay hidden in the darkness because they don't want a Savior and a Lord. They just want a Savior. That's why I read any of the Scriptures and it says, if you profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. If He came to die for you and rose again, if He is the resurrection and the life, and He calls you to be obedient to His commands, then He calls you to give up your life for Him, to tell others, to guide them. And what better, what does it gain a whole man, gain a man to, to, what does it profit a man, I'll get it right in a second, to gain the whole world, but to lose his very own soul? So think about the fact when they went to that tomb on Easter morning, they came to anoint a dead body, but they didn't find one, did they? They found an empty tomb because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So I said before that there was more evidence for the resurrection than there was for the fact of Julius Caesar even living. Have you heard of Lee Strobel? You've heard of him, right? He was a big atheist that was a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, and he said he was going to go out and investigate all this. And if he could defunct... I'm sorry, that just stopped me. It stopped me dead in my tracks when I saw that. <laughs> okay, David. He had, he had the little hat on. That one stopped me. Most times I don't get distracted, but that one stopped me. <laughs> he said, if I can go out and disprove the resurrection, then you'll lose your hope. Christianity is false. It won't matter that Jesus died because he's not the resurrection and the life. But he did raise from the dead. Lee Strobel could not come to any conclusion other than Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Nobody stole his body. It wasn't misplaced or lost, anything else. He rose from the dead. Now, did that make Lee Strobel believe? Nope, did not. Because all the knowledge in the world is not going to make me believe something I don't want to believe. You can tell me till I'm blue in the face that this is right. If I think I'm right, then I'm right. Okay? I know. <laughs> But I have been wrong once, maybe twice. But because of a praying wife, yeah, at least. <laughs> because of a praying wife and because God comes to you, he comes to all men. Lee Strobel came to Christ. He's a pastor now. The founder, one of the founders of the Harvard University, and that's why I was looking on my notes for what his name is. I don't remember his name. If you know it, ah, Simon Greenleaf. I got it now. I just looked right at it. See how that works? He was the most, the winningest attorney there ever was. He hadn't lost a case or anything. And he said, well, I'm going to go disprove this. Everybody asked him, go disprove this thing about Jesus Christ. Surely you can find enough evidence. Well, he didn't either. <laughs> and he became a believer. If you don't doubt, you won't come to the realization. You might. You might just simply believe it. But Peter doubted. John doubted. John wanted to call down fire from heaven. And then if you keep reading his words, he, all he preaches about is love, to love one another. So when they came to the tomb, they found no body. 
The women went back and told the disciples about it. If you read Scripture, Thomas wasn't there that day. He wasn't there the day that Jesus came in and told the other eleven. He wasn't there. So what he said to them, he says, unless I see Jesus, I'm not going to believe. You guys have all had too much to drink, whatever it is. We watched Jesus die. We watched him be put in a tomb. Men don't just come back to life on their own. Even if he raised Lazarus from the dead, how is he going to raise himself? But remember, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. So if we read in John chapter 20, and I'm reading from contemporary English Bible again, so it may be a little different. Starting verse 24, it says, Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. Not we've seen our Savior, we've seen the Lord. Because if he rose from the dead, <laughs> he is Lord of all. Because no one can do that. He is everything he claimed to be. But he replied, Thomas replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put the fingers in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hands into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, I rebuke you. Right? Nope, not what he said. Why did you doubt? It's not what he said. You disbeliever, you. No, here's what he said. He said, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe that I am who I say I am. That I am the Son of God. I am the resurrection and the life. That no one comes to the Father but by me. Believe that I am your Savior and your Lord. Thomas responded, My Lord and my God. He believed. My point in bringing out Thomas today is it doesn't matter if you doubt. If you doubt, come to the cross. And more than the cross, how could God love me so much that God Himself would sacrifice His only Son to save me? Come to the empty tomb also and find that Jesus offers resurrection and life to all who believe. In John chapter 14, Thomas is there again. Starting in verse 1, it says, Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My Father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me so that where I am, where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place I'm going. Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Remember the interpreter, William? He'll show us the way, right? Jesus answered, because the Holy Spirit will reveal God's Word as we read it. Sanctify us through and through. Make us holy. Make us like Christ. Teach us who Jesus is. And Jesus is the direct revelation of God Himself. And Jesus' answer was, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you believe this today? If you do believe this, then proclaim it. Proclaim that you serve a risen Savior and Lord. Teach it to your children. Impress it upon their hearts so that they might believe. Teach it to your friends and your neighbors, even your enemies, so that they may come to know Jesus Christ. Because guess what? We were all enemies, all nailing those nails into the hands and feet of Jesus. We were the ones piercing his side because he bled and died to save us. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus' humble faithfulness to save us. We thank you that he did not orphan us, but he, he left us with the power of the Spirit to seal us and to guide us, to live this life that we can have victory in Jesus, that we know that he rose from the grave that He ascended into heaven, that He is at the right hand of the Father, and that He will return for His children, those that belong to Him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nothing short of that. He is everything that He claimed to be, and we praise You, God, for an empty tomb. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.